image of God. So when we think about being made in the image of God on Trinity Sunday, maybe it's not too hard to make the leap. But for many of us, the idea of being made in the image of God and in the long trajectory of the church, the definition of what that means to be in God's image has tended to be fairly narrow. In the Western tradition, it has tended to focus on reason, that humans have a consciousness, a capacity to think and reason and remember backward and forward and make decisions that are distinctively different, it appears, from any other creature that God made. Hence, we're made in God's image. Or maybe it is that we have dominion over other creatures just like God has dominion so that we have our identity in God because we have a similar kind of power, a power to destroy or restore. And we certainly see that power at work in the world around us. But what if what if the imago dei is something about community? This week I read an article in the Scientific American uh, by Dr. Uh, Rebecca Lester. And she wrote a piece about a patient she had. She's an anthropologist and a social worker. And she had a patient who came to her with a disease that we used to call multiple dis personality disorder, but now they call it uh, dissociative identity disorder. This young woman had been profoundly sexually traumatized by a religious leader, by a pastor. She had coped with it by creating different parts of herself that did not interact. So she came to the social worker and in her high school years, and there were times when she just had complete amnesia. She would know that she must have been at school, but she couldn't remember anything that happened. And she was also having behaviors that were very self-destructive. So over the years, the social worker worked with her, and at one point, it suddenly became clear that there was another person with, this, with Rebecca Lester in the room, and it wasn't Ella. It was a little girl, and it was Ella's body, but her voice had changed, her memories had changed, and all about her was slightly different. In the course of that therapy, Dr. Lester, who's also a cultural anthropologist, realized that there were many members in this Ella, Ella's uh, psyche. There was a little girl who was joyful and safe and who could tell her things that happened when the 17-year-old Ella wasn't around. There were other parts of her, one who was completely stuck in the terror and fear of that trauma. And so what Dr. Lester did, which is completely unusual in a lot of ways in our world because we all think about ourselves as one thing, right? We think that, that when somebody has multiple personalities, it means they have to all be reintegrated into the one. And we think that if somebody has had this one experience that they don't want to talk about, the whole goal needs to be to bring that into the forefront and get it healing. And maybe that's true. But Dr. Foss, uh, Lester proposed that we are a community of selves. We are a community of selves. And when you think about yourself, you can kind of resonate, right? I have a community in myself that wants to do two things at the very opposite things at the same time. And they're both talking in my head. And I'll bet you have this as well. So when she started to think about this community of selves, she realized that this young woman needed to simply learn a few basics. And I'm going to apply the basics that she taught Ella to what we hear in 2 Corinthians. Okay? So one of them is put things in order. That's the first thing that when, when Paul is ending this letter, saying goodbye, he says, put things in order. For that young woman with this community of selves, it began with writing letters that she left in a journal so that every self could read and start to know who's in the community, 
Who's inside of me? What are all these people? And maybe for us, I mean, none of us have this disorder, thanks be to God, but maybe there are parts of ourselves that aren't actually in the community. Maybe there are parts of our memory that aren't in the community that we're not letting back in because it's too painful. What does it mean to put things in order for our inner community? Paul was trying to get people to put things in order in the wider community. And we together as the church are called to do this because community is about order. You can't be co-uniting if everybody's just coming in with their own agenda and not interacting and not having common cause. That's what community is about. That sort of corporate flourishing. And for Paul, the big concern was that the Corinthians were listening to these super apostles, as he was calling them, uh, and not, and being led astray. So put things in order. Figure out your, what is right and who to listen to and have those conversations. That is what he was saying. So moving into the next thing that um, Paul had said, was that we need to listen to his appeal, to listen. In Ella's situation with there's those multiple selves, that's what she began to do, is to read her journal and listen to all those parts of herself. Listening. What are we not listening to? Sometimes for us, those, that community of selves includes talk to the hand, I'm done with you. You aren't allowed to be a part of the conversation of my community, my inner community. And sometimes that's where we need to be healing, is in relationships. Sometimes we need to listen to the past or listen to concerns about the future, but opening ourselves to let the walls within us become windows, let them become spaces where there can be interaction. When we as a community listen to each other, that's how we put things in order and move into common cause and purpose. So in the fullness of life, these two things happen, listening and putting things in order. Both of our goodbyes today from 2 Corinthians and from the Gospels are about God's desire for flourishing. For wholeness. And that was what Dr. Lester's desire was for Ella. She never became what in the Western world we name as human consciousness and reason, this one person fully integrated, fully one thing presenting to the world consistently. That never happened. But her voices, that inner community that was broken, started to move into shalom, into peace, where more and more she could not lose her memory, more and more she could not want to hurt herself because she understood herself better. That's God's desire for us, both individually and together. This past week, We've had some real challenges. A week ago Friday, in this community, we experienced trauma. We experienced a shooting just across the street, and it happened, that's the second time in three weeks. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for me, who live nearby. It's a big deal for you, who drive here. This community has brokenness. I can't think of a more epitomizing sense of the brokenness of community than a barbecue on our lawn with music and festivity and inclusion and love and death being meted out across the street. Nobody died, thanks be to God, but certainly they could have. What are we going to be? Who are we going to be in this world? Are we going to be community? Are we going to walk together and believe that we are meant to be here? Are we going to quit? Are we going to quit? Who is God for us? Are we going to believe what we say? That we are meant 
to walk here, to be here, to stand together in our fear, in our uncertainty, believing that as we listen, as we put things in order, like tables and chairs and hot dogs and brats and music, and we show love in the face of hatred, that we are a part of the integration of the world. That is not easy. It's scary. Just like it's not easy when it's inside of us and it's broken. But we have a God who put us here, who called us here. And that God will not leave us or forsake us. Remember, remember, I am with you. Amen.